something that you uh, uh, counter in your piece is the uh, uh, this kind of liberal narrative about pandemic response, about science, right? And how, you know, Trump was for the past year, you know, this big scapegoat for it because he was, you know, he was explicitly defying even like, like not just what the scientists were telling him, but just like even common sense, just like basic rationality, just solely for political cultural reasons. Uh, But that being said, as you point out in your piece, you know, there have been within this country varying regimes um, red states and blue states and dealing with the pandemic. And there's been a point of you know pride among liberals, right, of, about following the orders, about following the lockdowns, and a kind of, uh, uh, on the other hand, a, a, a social stigmatization of not just people who are going to Walmart and, uh, you know, making a big scene of not wearing a mask and, like, going in freaking viral video coughing on people, but of entire polities, of entire red states, you know, like Florida, for instance, saying, you know, hey, you're not they're not locking down and, you know, they're going to get hit with this third wave. Uh, But as you point out in your piece, California and Florida, which had two very different regimes, two very, very different governors, ended up with comparable uh, mortality rates. Yeah. And it's not, you know, I think it's hard for us to say for sure that that would have happened sort of independent of policy. I suspect that if Florida had been more restrictive. Um, there would have been some, you know, some positive effect, you know, suppression effect. Um, but it does tell you that if you know the power of policy is probably considerably more limited than we um, than we want to believe, and you know that's true not just in the U.S. It's really true all around the world. So, you know, the U.S. has you know about seventeen hundred deaths per million. Um, citizens. Germany has 900. So judging by mortality, which isn't at all the only metric, but it's sort of one useful top line metric for judging national performance. Um, We've done twice as bad as Germany. And yet, and so you can say the difference between Donald Trump and Angela Merkel might account for some of that. But when you judge those countries together compared to the performance of countries in East Asia and Oceania in particular, you know, you see New Zealand has five deaths per million. Taiwan has 0.5 deaths per million. Um, and many of the countries of, of that region of the world are well below 100. So, you know, even though there's probably some impact of leadership and national policy, and certainly Donald Trump was like the last person you would want to be running a of country course, in yeah. this in a time of pandemic. Nevertheless, you know, it seems as though um, there are other forces at work here. Now, some of them are possibly like climate related and that sort of thing have, having to do with residential density, employment structure. Um, and part of it is that, you know, we are less capable of making totally, um, you know, pandemic driven decisions in our lives than I think our policymakers like to pretend. So, you know, the difference in individual behavior and mobility between, say, California and Florida was actually quite small. The difference between states where there were really restrictive, um, you know, measures put in place and ones where there were hardly any people sort of behave the same way in those two places. And that has to do, I think, with a little bit of culture and people's unwillingness to totally lock down and need to socialize and that sort of thing. It also has to do with the demands of, you know, what it means to be a low wage worker in an economy where there's very little support and you simply can't decide to shelter in place and like conduct your business meetings on Zoom because that's not the kind of work you do. That's not the kind of, that's not how you draw your your wage. And, um, you know, in that sense, the, you know, shutting down restaurants and that sort of thing, um, imposing social distancing measures just didn't drive the course of the disease in nearly the way that, you know, the sort of Twitter narrative would have had you believe. Um, if, you know, if, if that narrative were true, like New York would have been an incredibly safe place all year instead of being for a long time, the worst part of the whole country, same with California. And while I still think personally, I would rather be living through the pandemic in a blue state and do take comfort in some of those protections it just, you know, looking globally and even looking nationally, it just tells you that there are many other factors here well beyond or well above um, policy that are that are really driving outcomes. And we sort of, I think we sh- should going forward, think pretty hard about what those are and how we can um, address them so that, you know, quote unquote, the next time um, we actually have some stronger tools in our toolkit. Yeah, everyone would rather have been Australian 
And that's the first time in human history anyone's ever said that. Uh, and like that difference is pretty stark, right? I mean, uh, in terms of, you know, in just looking at mortality rate with, with the, the standard caveats, you know, we uh, like the UK did worse than us. Uh, Germany did better, but still pretty bad. And then you look at a place like New Zealand or a place like Australia and they, they eliminated it. They wiped it out and they managed to handle any uh, like con successfully contain any future outbreak. But the conclusion that you would have a straw is not that Boris Johnson did and his government did profoundly badly uh, or that. Uh, Aldern and her government did uh, uh, profoundly well. You wouldn't lay all of those deaths on Johnson's doorstep and you wouldn't say that, you know, just in terms of comparing policy regimes, that Aldern deserves all of the uh, uh, credit for stopping the virus. Or, or would you say that? I mean, I think she deserves a lot of credit, but I think there were some advantages. You know, when the when the disease first arose, New Zealand and Australia were in summer, which meant that they were in a relatively um, the disease had a harder time transmitting there, which meant that they were sort of at a natural advantage. Um, they were sort of combating slower spread than we were combating in the northern hemisphere. Um, New Zealand is an island. Australia is also, to some degree, depending on how you want to think of it, an island, and that affects international transport, and that means fewer sort of fewer arrivals of the disease. Um, and, you know, and in Z New Zealand in particular, there's a very high degree of social trust, um, sort of collective solidarity, uh, national health care. Australia is a little bit of a different story. They have a much more fractious politics um, and they haven't, they weren't able to do quite as well. Although again, by global standards, they were able to do very, very well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that, and I think that there is a role for leadership there. So New Zealand at first was taking this sort of same wait and see approach that we saw play out all through Western Europe and the Americas. And after a few weeks of that, they sort of decided to change course pretty rapidly and um, aim for a disease elimination strategy, which was much more intrusive. And I think to some degree, you, you can credit that reversal. Um, you know, you can credit their success against the disease to that reversal. On the other hand, when you do pull out globally, you know, either you have to say that, you know, these say 30, 40, 50 leaders across these 30, 40, 50 countries all across Europe and the Americas all behaved really terribly and all made mm -hmm. parallel failures or that there's something going on independent or distinct from or below or above, however you want to think of it. Um, the particular pandemic policies that these places um, instituted that gave them such a terrible, right. terrible outcome. Right. And I think, you know, I think the truth is that the whole thing is multifactorial policy does play a role, but it, it's not the central thing determining, uh, determining pandemic outcomes. If it was, then, you know, you would see, I mean, you know, Peru had one of the most restrictive lockdowns in the world and they had a completely catastrophic pandemic. Yeah, right. Because in the countries that, you know, failed, you know, and we're in, we we're on team failure, they had they had radically different regimes, like the difference between uh, uh, Italy and uh, Sweden, for instance, and the countries that succeeded, you know, there are, uh, you know, New Zealand, Australia, I think you cite South Korea, Japan as basically success stories and Vietnam and China. Uh, again, they had, you know, various, variously different and some of those are rich and some of them are poor and some of them have national health care and some of them have something very far from it. Um, some of them are, you know, ethnically homogenous. Some of them are not like, you know, they're huge. Some are, some are left wing, some are right wing. Um, there are huge differences in both of those buckets. It feels like there's a, a it's weird to even have this push to identify these solitary factors. I mean, from a public health or just general science perspective, it seems obvious that they're going to be multiple factors going into these outcomes. You talk about whether or not there was a restrictive policy in a particular country or state, but that doesn't even tell you whether or not the behavior actually reflected those policy constraints. Um, and that's part of what you're seeing in the red state, blue state difference. And I think you made a, a point uh, earlier in your article that despite all of the internet hand-wringing about Trump voters or what have you not wearing masks in Walmart, mostly compliance was there across the board. So it, the very fact that there does seem to be this media narrative push to identify these solitary factors, it seems like a, a, a push to politicize the pandemic. And moralize. And, and more, and, oh, yeah, but the moralizing is, is for political ends, right? No one's just like, oh, let's just guilt and shame to guilt and shame. It's no, let's guilt and shame to advance the interest of this party or that party. 
And so I'm curious about whether or not we're going to see or there is any evidence of any consequences being felt by any of the folks who can be rightly pointed to as having misled or misrepresented information. Dr. Fauci with the conflicting narratives about mask use early on. <clears throat> Governor Cuomo obviously is taking some mm -hmm. heat right now. Should we expect to see any consequences from this, given how much confusion there is? I'm not sure. I mean, when you look globally, the political consequences for people who've presided over really terrible pandemics seem to be relatively limited. Um, and I think to some degree, that may be because the public understands actually in a way that the commentariat hasn't, that this, these are really complicated, complex challenges that are not um, solely in the hands of policymakers to, um, to respond to. But I also think it may be um, just that we aren't interested in looking all that critically at poor performance um, when we're thinking about what, you know, whether to punish or reward leaders. And I think that's, you know, that's really problematic. I mean, you know, I, I think that there will be a sort of wave of reconsideration of Anthony Fauci. I do think that he, you know, for all of his um, skill at navigating the, you know, the Trump Trump world and remaining for most of the pandemic, you know, at the president's side, I think it's hard to say exactly what benefit that actually um, gave the country and how much better it prepared us than if he had said at the beginning in February, this is a really, really scary disease. We are woefully unprepared for it. Everybody who's in any position to prepare should be doing the maximum they can today. Hmm. I think ultimately that might have been, even if he had gotten, you know, he wouldn't have gotten fired because his position is protected. But even if he had gotten totally marginalized in the White House, I think that still might have been um, a much more effective thing for him to do. And he didn't. I think that there will be some amount of like op-eds and, you know, in books written about the pandemic, you know, reconsiderations of his of his role. But I don't think I don't think that like the normie liberal, um, you know, three years from now is going to think of Anthony Fauci as one of the great villains of this of this pandemic, because so much of the experience of the disease for everybody was free, as you say, like through that partisan lens. And we're so I mean. We want, like, as Americans, we we want to see everything through that lens. I don't think there's much eagerness to get beyond it. You know, I will say in the Biden year, in the Biden, so far into the Biden administration. In the century of Biden. <laughs> there does seem to be a little bit more willingness to think a little more broad-mindedly about some of these policies. So, um, you know, and to some degree, think about what that says about the past. But it's not, I think, at the level of reflection that we we really need or should have if we're sort of being intellectually honest about um, where we fucked up. Well, where do you see, where do you see those moments of greater reflection? Because I, I, I obviously have my lens in my bubble, but it feels to me like it always does where all of the good things that are happening, some of which can be rightly attributed to Biden, some of which were wheels set in motion prior to Biden um, are, are being attributed to the fact that, Trump isn't in office anymore. So we have a vaccine. It's being distributed. Who knows what the difference in distribution would be like under Donald Trump. But it feels like a very flat narrative that Biden saved us. The conversation is kind of percolating a little bit about um, some of the issues around allowing the manufacturer of generics to address the enormous inequities uh, with the rest of the world, basically the global South, not having any access to vaccines at all. But outside of that, it still feels like a very partisan narrative to me. I guess what I would say is, you know, I think discussion of lockdowns has been um, much more nuanced um, than it had been last year. That may just be a sign yeah. of um, experience, you know, and, um, and time. But I don't think that there is the sort of, you know, tribal desperation to like respond to any uptick in cases with, you know, full closure of all schools and all dining and all the rest of it. Um, I think that, you know, most people, most places are interested in a more complex assessment of risk, which we've been lacking for the last year. Um, I do think that there's been, you know, there's still a ton of like social media. There was people were really agitated about spring break in Florida um, and all the risks that that would bring. And I do think there was risk there. I don't want to totally downplay it. Um, but it also isn't the case that Florida is like the hotspot of American COVID right now. That's Michigan, which is, you know, um, can sit really in the worst spot of the whole country. And um, again, had some of the strictest measures as well. Yeah, they, they, they've done they've been less strict this time around. But um, over the course of the year, for sure. I mean, a lot of it is really bad luck. That was the 
really the first place where the B117 variant really spread, um, and that's from the UK variant. And, you know, some of that is just, just chance. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the, one of the, for me, one of the big lessons is how much of a role that chance and bad luck really play. Um, and thinking about, you know, the getting beyond partisanship in, in assessing, um, pandemic performance. I mean, I do think that, you know, the, um, possible recall of, of Gavin Newsom, um, suggests some liberal recriminations there. Um, on the other hand, that's, you know, he's someone who's, you know, he did a lot <laughs> by, by national standards. He, you know, he, he imposed quite restrictive, um, policies, even if they weren't all that well targeted. And Christy Noem, who had been celebrated in her state, um, for a while for being a sort of maverick, um, you know, open, open society advocate, um, I think has come in for some more criticism more recently from her constituents. But, you know, in general, I think, um, as I said, I don't think that we're where we need to be or where we should be in terms of thinking about um, the root causes and how little um, partisan preference really determines um, local outcomes. It it seems to me that we've kind of given up on beating COVID, you know? Uh, I think practically we gave up on that like last spring. Right, right. I mean, because we're since then, since very early on when, you know, back when there was a chance that we could have shut down international travel and, you know, just confined it to uh, various borders uh, and then, you know, tried to to go into lockdown and then kill it out, which is essentially what they did in New Zealand, right? Since then, you know, once it metastasized, uh, things broke out in New York, then everything just became mitigation. And I I feel like if you look at the curve, you know, after things were relatively, you know, hunky-dory over the summer, especially compared to now, there's just been successions of waves that have just been getting worse. And it's no longer shocking to look at that information. Now you just, you just kind of look at it and say, yeah, yeah, that's COVID. Uh, that's, that's COVID for you. Uh, so like we're just in full mitigation mode with the, uh, with the hope that, well, the vaccines will roll out and we'll get herd immunity and that'll pretty much be the end of it. You know, I think that we could have done a much better job starting in the summer if we had tried. We probably couldn't have gotten all the way to zero like New Zealand or Australia. Australia didn't really get all the way to zero, but practically to zero or South Korea um, has. But if we had, you know, rolled out mass testing um, or and in particular mass rapid testing in the summer, which we had the technical capacity to do. And in fact, mm-hmm. we had factories full of those tests waiting to be shipped out if they were approved by the FDA, which they were only quite recently. We could have really, really controlled the disease. There was just a big study about how rapid testing and just so listeners know, this is like basically a home pregnancy test that you you, know, you can take. And it's not quite as accurate as the, the gold standard PCR test, but it's quite accurate. It was actually better at telling you whether you're infectious. So it's a better guide to personal behavior than the PCR test. It's just mm-hmm. less accurate mm-hmm. in terms of whether you're actually infected. Anyway, there was this big you know, study in Slovakia where just in a couple of weeks, they cut the, um, the caseload by like 70% because of um, rapid daily testing. And we could have done that. These things are cheap enough. They cost a dollar to produce. We could have shipped them to every American to use at least once a week. Um, but we didn't. And we didn't, for complicated reasons that have to do with, you know, the sort of broken uh, regulatory bureaucracy, which wasn't able to respond um, quickly in a time of medical crisis. And because we have a sort of public health apparatus that wasn't willing to accept that an imperfect tool that is still useful is worth rolling out. And instead wanted to hold out for something that met a gold clinical standard. And, you know, if you're recommending a surgery or course of treatment or something, you probably want to get a PCR test. You want to get the thing that can tell you most accurately whether you have a disease. But if, you know, if you're trying to figure out whether or not it's okay for you to go out to the grocery store today, um, or to go to work as a delivery person or whatever, and you have a test that's like 97% accurate telling you that you're not infectious, that's a really useful piece of information. <laughs> and, that's it, funda- you know. and that's fundamentally a policy decision to hold off on rolling something like that out. Right. I mean, there's no you can't point to objective science behind it. We just know what the efficacy is. We we know the safety of it. It's just a decision of whether or not we're going to distribute that uh, widely. And, and, you know, in my mind, if I were a policymaker, I'd say, you know, okay, well, the way we've gone about this is we've just thrown everyone to the wolves, basically, and said, you figure it out. You figure out, you know. When you what you what your risk level is, you figure out, you know, wear a mask, but you figure out when you have to self quarantine, you figure out whether or not you want to go to Thanksgiving, whatever. Uh, if that's the case and it's all just 
under uh, 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 under a, a kind of free market, you know, self-reliance rubric, then, of course, you want people to have as much information as possible. And I, 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 uh, if I remember correctly, you, you also uh, drew a comparison to the HIV epidemic where, you know, in safe sex, like that's a ma- that's not you're not preaching abstinence. It's a matter of here's the here's the factual information that you need in order to evaluate risks. Yeah, that's something that, you know, to um, to bring your question earlier that, you know, that has come out more and more over the last few months is that there, the people who are advocating for a risk management approach, especially drawing on the lessons of the HIV crisis, those people have kind of gotten more prominent platforms and mm-hmm. got, gotten more prominent hearing over the last few months, just in the sort of public health communication side of things. You hear a little bit less about like, you can't do anything that gives that, you know, gives you even at the tiniest slice of risk, that's totally unacceptable, it's immoral, et cetera. Those people are still; those voices are still out there. Those vigilant voices are the voices of vigilance are still out there. But there are many more people who are saying we need to have a kind of nuanced human risk management approach to this um, to this challenge. Unfortunately, we had very little of that over the course of the year. And in fact, I think one of the reasons that um, mass testing, rapid testing in particular, was not embraced and put forward um, was because many of these public health leaders, both in the government and you know at the FDA, et cetera, but also to sort of opining from the sidelines, didn't really trust people to use that information wisely. And they would say, we can't give you, you know, an imperfect test, which tells you that you're probably not infectious because the risk that you then go out and socialize and spread the disease is too high. And, you know, maybe I could buy that if the, if the test was like 50% accurate or like 30% accurate, mm-hmm. but it's like well over 90. Yeah. And, it's just insane to me to think that you would not, and maybe some people who, who get the test are going to still go out and behave badly, even with a positive result. That's totally possible. But thinking about the society as a whole, you have to trust, you have to believe that people armed with more information about whether they are a risk to others is going to have a significant you know, effect on the rate of transmission. You have to believe that. If you don't, like, then what kind of, what's the public health policy that you're really pushing? You know, you're just keeping everybody in the dark. <laughs> 